There we go. And the recording will now show that the uh, note well slide was shared. So with that, I guess I can switch to the sort of agenda. This is an open working meeting. Um, thank you everybody for putting up with the last minute excitement where we had to use uh, Zoom instead of the uh, IETF WebEx. I think everybody's found it. I don't see any panicked messages on the list or, or to me saying, help, oh, where's the meeting? And with luck, uh, the WebEx will work uh, in the future. So like I said, this is an open working meeting to see about facilitate progress on the enhanced uh, data, data plane. Agendas, on, agendas uh, on the on the screen. Anybody, anybody want to bash it? All right. Consider the agenda bashed. So, first item is um, process oriented topics. Anything anyone would like to talk about? Requirements, draft contents, evaluation. Three suggestions are there. And uh, comments, questions. Uh, hi, David. Uh, I I remember in the side meeting, uh, people mentioned that maybe more uh, evaluation criteria could be considered in the requirement document, but I I cannot remember exact exactly what are they. So maybe I'm not and sure. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. I remember either. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe you people would like to raise it again, or they they don't insist uh, on any new requirements here. Uh, maybe we just think it is um, you know good to 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 satisfy all the people's uh, thoughts. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very important uh, a part for the uh, uh, evaluation because uh, for queuing you can imagine all kind of algorithms, but uh, from the hardware point of view, not everyone is feasible. Uh, also, depends on the uh, uh, your link rate. If the for high link rate, even the algorithm cannot be that complicated. So, but so that is really from the implementation point of view. Not sure if it's, this is uh, uh, under the evaluation criteria though. Well, I think what I recall from the side meeting, and please feel free to, to correct me if I get this wrong, is that uh, there was some discussion that said requirements wrap is important. And we need to get the requirements track stable, but there's going to need to be evaluation criteria such as relative feasibility and implementation that'll be beyond the scope of a concrete requirement that can go into a requirements track. So, so when when we're talking when we are talking about the requirement draft, we are specifically talking about those that one the the working group adopted one, right? I think. Yes, the skin of the okay. skin of yeah. draft. Yes, uh, yes. So I, teach. Yes. Yes, I kind of think. Um, we are kind of doing the work in parallel. The first thing is that working that working group document. I guess we all hope it could be moved smoothly and get stable as soon as possible. And uh, on the other side, uh, from the current text, I see most of the requirements doesn't really touch. Uh, the very detailed implementation evaluation evaluation criteria. Uh, there are so many solutions, and each solution has their own maybe the criteria. So I would like to to see that the current requirement draft, the the working group uh, draft for the requirements stay in that 
in, in, in its current way, which means it's a more abstract or more high level way. For example, to say it need to support the long links in the large scale. It need to support, for example, the um, uh, all kinds of equipments with all different features, for example, cannot uh, uh, really do the global time synchronization, all these kind of things. Um, but for the evaluation criteria, uh, I I think it first came from a uh, tallest document. Uh, that one looks to me more like a, 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 a companion document. So uh, maybe the, each of the solution draft should talk about its own evaluation criteria. That could be some common part. For example, whether the whether it can um, achieve the bounded latency, bounded jitter, especially because that's a different aspect for different uh, uh, solutions. But uh, that I would like to suggest we leave the uh, evaluation criteria, uh, at least the text part for this, uh, for each of the solution to explain by itself instead of put all together into a requirement draft so that we can move the requirement draft uh, sooner. That's, that's, that's my, my, my suggestion. I certainly like the idea of each solution talking about uh, its evaluation criteria. Um, Torlos's draft is, is useful, but Torlos will be the first to tell you that he's strongly associated with one of the solutions. And I'd like the uh, opportunity for everybody to contribute to the uh, criteria used by the solutions. And, and I think I exactly said this uh, on the mic, right? So that uh, I, I don't intentionally, but maybe unintentionally, you know, choose the criteria based on, you know, what I felt important, which may be, you know, also what uh, we felt important about our um, uh, TCQF mechanism. So yeah. I completely agree that, uh, you know, we, we should have everybody bring forward evaluation criteria. I hope that, you know, the ones that um, we discussed, like, for example, what the heck do we need on the wire for a particular mechanism should be clear that, uh, you know, we, we we easily have them for all the mechanisms. And, you know, as soon as multiple mechanisms have started to bring in evaluation criteria, I think we can start uh, merging them and comparing them. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, and perhaps do some filtering. Um, an idea that I tossed around, I don't know whether, whether, whether it's a good one or not, might be to say, hey, every solution, Think through evaluation criteria, and let's have a look at, at at what your top five are. What are the five things that you think make 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 this solution a really a, a, a really good one? I don't know whether five is the right number, but what do people think? Yeah, I mean that's pretty much what I what I said as as the gamification in terms of right. Obviously, think about the ones that uh, are positive for your document, um, and as soon as people start doing this, I think another round in 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 a side meeting would have us uh, agree on which you know evaluation criteria we would like to see across all the different documents, right? Yeah. So so. Uh... So that basically means each of the solution document had gave its own, maybe a separate section to talk about their their own evaluation criteria together with the, 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 the together with the one that uh, the criteria has already been suggested in your document, so that we can do another round of review to see whether there are other some other common part to be uh, extracted. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think there's a um, yes. I think there's a fine line to be walked. I think it's fine to point to Torlos's document for yeah. specific criteria that um, another solution wants to use. But um, I'd like to avoid the impression that we're starting from all the criteria in Torlos's document. <laughs> yeah. Well, and certainly, I mean, the 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 independence isn't helped by 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 trying to 
um, you know, include the evaluation of TCQF into it, right? So I'll be happy to make another revision where I'm moving the evaluation of TCQF out of the document, um, and 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 hopefully, you know, we can figure out how to uh, evolve uh, the common criteria. Whether you know it's it's going to be anywhere close to to that draft, or if it's going to be different. I just wanted to you know put one proposal up uh, in the ring. I think removing TCQF uh, examples into a separate graph would be good. You willing to do that for us? Oh, of course. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, I think for the uh, for for that part for the uh, evaluation criteria, there is uh, one more one more thing we probably want to pay attention is for the same term or same word, actually people may have different definition. For example, we al uh, it, it always heard that we want to maintain the last state uh, on each of the node, but what what's the definition for the states? For some, for some, for some of the solution, the state is simply just mean a, a table with a few entries, but for some of them, it's like uh, the state with, uh, with, with with the queue information and with the, with the queuing management. So uh, I guess that's also the part we probably want to pay attention when we are doing the uh, evaluation criteria. So an another thing is uh, there are three bullets. So uh, can we talk a little regard about the first bullet? separating the queuing uh, schedule sure. mechanism. <laughs> yeah, this sure. part is, yeah, looks a little bit harder for me. Uh, yeah, as I also uh, said in the email, um, that look, it looks to me that there is no normative language to define the scheduling or queuing mechanism in current .NET document. I know there, um, there the IEEE TSN actually do this. I mean, they have already done quite a, a number of works. So, but uh, basically they have a model, a uh, very well recognized model, for example, like the transmission queues and all the kind of things. So um, uh, originally for the, for the uh, TCQF or the cycle ID based IP data plane kind of thing, we are thinking the data plane is a standard vehicle for the for that scheduling mechanism, if we don't have this vehicle, uh, do we want to publish the isolated? I mean, the standalone scheduling mechanism as a as an IFC. Ultimately, I, I I'm so <laughs> that's part. <laughs> hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question. I'll try to answer it. Um, I don't think there's any problem pointing to an IEEE published uh, scheduling mechanism and say, use this. Um, I don't think all the proposals here, the some of the proposals here are proposing new scheduling mechanisms and those would need to be published here as, uh, here as RFCs, I think. I think the point was more about if we leave the packetization over the wire out of a document and try to define a, um, uh, mechanism solely, you know, independent of the on the wire um, uh, encoding, can it then become standards track? And if so, what do we need to do for oh, it? Oh, okay. Oh, 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 okay. I see what the, what the concern is. So we need to separate a couple of topics. One is how do we go about figuring what we're going to put into the data plane, the enhanced data plane, and the second is in how we're going to write it up as an RFC. Um, I strongly believe, and I think Turles, you at least agree, at least Turles agrees, that um, we need to focus on the scheduling and queuing mechanisms they're going to use, assuming that there'll be some way of transmitting the data to them somehow, and then come back and then figure out how we do data transmission. Now, it may be that the right thing to do as an RFC is to do that combination uh, and publish the mechanism and the on the wire information coding in one document. But it's not, not a decision we have to make now. And the separation that 
um, I'm referring to in this bullet is mostly a separation so that we can make progress because the queuing mechanisms and the encoding on the wire seem to be somewhat separable. Yeah, and 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 maybe you know um, it would be good to hear from you if and if the approach that uh, TSVWG had taken on on DiffSurf, where um, you know um, if if I remember correctly the the standards track document describing per hop behaviors um, didn't define you know uh, the on the wire information, but we do have the on the wire information, which is that. Uh, you know, the uh, DSCP and the ECN uh, fields, which which both relied on, right? And they they, they were defined in, in a di different document, but the per hop behaviors were also standardized. You know, writing a note, writing a note to myself before I, I switch over and, 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 and try to page in the DISSERV uh, history. Um, So I think it should be fine, right? But I think our concern, Jesus and my, goes back to when we originally brought um, TCQF, we didn't call it that way, back uh, to um, DeadNet around Bangkok, um, at which point in time it seemed very likely that uh, um, one first would have had to resolve the encoding on the wire into something acceptable before arriving at a standardized solution. So that's that's where, you know, the history of our concern yeah. comes from, at least from my side. Yeah, and in looking at what's in front of the working group, I think things have turned around where it, and there's lots and lots of proposals for, for encoding things this way or that way on the wire. Far more of those than there are, than there are proposals for how to actually do the queuing and scheduling in a node. And so figuring out how to do the queuing and scheduling in the node will, let, will, will provide some insight into what we need to encode on the wire. Um, does that make, I mean, and as I said earlier, we can lazy evaluate whether the encoding and scheduling are separate RFCs or public or, 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 or published together. That, that's a decision we made very, very late in the process. Yeah, so it sounds from the perspective of this uh, cycle ID tag CQF, probably Tolis and I could, yeah, we can do some offline talking and maybe we kind of separate the scheduling part, extract this part uh, to, be a, to be a separate document. Actually, I think it's doable, even, I mean, for the CQF in high school, CQF plus is, it, to me, I kind of think it's even easier for the others because CQF has already a very, has a good referenced uh, standard in TSN. So, so that, that's, that could be, yeah, this work I think could be done. That would be very compare, useful. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I, I have a hard time figuring out how to deal with two almost the same. <laughs> Graphs on how to do TCQ and how to do uh, CQF with explicitly identified cycles. I have one draft. So I, I, I think I, I think I have a better idea of, of, of how to code. So thank you, Yuju. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will talk with Tallis to see what's the best way to to do this. And at the same time, I I remember there there is uh, some. Some discussion in the mailing list talking about uh, it would be great. It would be, um, it would be good that um, um, if more details can be specified, so that the implementers uh, can better understand uh, in order to make in order to produce the interoperable implement implementations. So it could be uh, it could be another uh, companion document to talk about the. Uh, like the provisioning part, uh, because uh, if we talk about the cycle ID based uh, uh, TCQF, uh, it looks to me that the data plane uh, is quite straightforward. It's like uh, 
incoming cycle ID and mapped it to an outgoing cycle ID that uh, each data frame will do so. But uh, uh, there are some uh, provisioning part, one time step, one time thing is not a per data packet thing. So to do those base parameter provisioning and uh, initialization of the like the buffers and the determination, how to determine this mapping relationship or all these kind of things. Uh, I, I, I don't think I, I don't think it's a core part of a scheduling, but it could be a, 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 a good information to be provided for, for implementers to understand. So that's uh, if for the other solution, if, if such information is also available, now I think the causers may, want, may also want to consider to provide this. Certainly, separation of control plane from data plane makes a lot of sense. Uh, DIFSER very much did that. The DIFSER was predominantly a data plane spec. Um, it okay. didn't have much to say about the control protocols you used, used to provision it. And if I may be so critical as to say that the magic of uh, the control parameters uh, like, you know, queue length relative to each other and uh, drop priorities and all that stuff, the absence of, you know, well-specified, uh, you know, <laughs> control plane that kind of knows how to calculate all these things in a working way that that was a little bit the death of, of a lot of the more advanced thinking uh, in DivSurf that then never got really uh, widely spread. So so when, we, when we're talking about DivSurf uh, examples, which which IFC we are we are specifically talking about? Do, do you have the RFC number so that I can? There's the DivSurf architecture RFC by that title. I'm always forgetting the number. Oh, okay, let, let me. Twenty four seventy five, okay. and that that that's actually the doc, the better doctor will get the the actually the actual normative data plane framework spec is twenty four seventy four, which contains a lot less material. Okay. Thanks. Uh, about the first point, uh, separating queuing mechanisms from the on the wire information, I think it is reasonable. Um, a little concern is that uh, there is uh, some there are some solutions under discussion that is uh, really difficult to decouple with the encapsulation. For example, the, there is a mechanism we have raised a long time ago called the CSQF. Uh, and also, uh, I think Yakov has uh, um, has some similar idea uh, with uh, SRTSN. The, these documents are both uh, trying to use segment routing to uh, to you know couple the time information with the uh, explicit routine, which is indicated by the segment routing. So uh, I think for other mechanisms, maybe the encapsulation and queuing mechanisms is not um, to, uh, to you know, coupled together uh, very tightly and it can be separate, uh, uh, discussed separately. But for these kind of mechanisms, maybe uh, it is really difficult because, um, you know, only with segment routing, it can use the seed to indicate uh, the the it's some like time time label stack inside the the packet. So I'm wondering, is that possible also to take these kind of mechanisms into consideration? Um, although they may be highly related to the encapsulation. Hmm. Maybe there's no way to frame it. Because she was saying, when I listen to you talk about it, it sounds like you're talking about a mechanism that is primarily, if only applicable when segment routing is in use. Yes. And yes. perhaps a applicability of that sort of form. What's the, it, what is the assumed, the, it, if, it, if there's a specific uh, assumed protocol framework um, could be part of the criteria and then, and then it could be documented that way as part of the criteria exercise that this is a solution um, that requires uh, requires writing, writing to be used. Uh, so, 
Yeah, Torles. No, so I, I, I think the, what, please anybody, you know, who feels his mechanism is misrepresented what I'm saying, but um, right now, I think with the, with the fact that all the mechanisms trying to provide bounded latency will need to reserve the resources for the flow in the network somehow. And uh, typically that means that these mechanisms from the control plane do assume that they can be fixed to a particular path for which these resources are uh, allocated. And so how do you fix um, a dead net flow to a particular path? Um, traditionally, I think we have in the architecture specified this by having per dead net flow state on every hop, um, such as a static route or set up with the RSVP or you know controller based. Um, per flow um, uh, static route for, for the dead net flow. And in the scaling I, mechanism- I'd be careful about assuming that the state necessary, even for, for unenhanced dead net, is necessarily per flow. I mean, I understand where you're going, that, that resources have to be reserved, but be careful about jumping from there to saying that that, that inherently requires per flow state. So, Right. So, I mean, this 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 is exactly where uh, I think we we should understand what we think our solutions provide. Because, um, how how would you, David, think you you solve the the resource reservation in, in the case where you know the flow could just because of failures in the data plane reconverge onto a different path? I'm going to give you two answers because I'm going to try to have to to uh, to have my cake and eat it too. Um, one of them is that this has to be considered by whatever it is that is reserving the resources, and I don't and I and the and the other place the other half of the answer is I think this is a problem for basic debt net without the enhancements. And I hesitate to go taking on problems that already exist in the base debt net as part of the enhancement uh, activity. But my, my claim is that in um, basic debt net, you know, um, the problem is resolved by mechanisms that have per hop per flow state. I would agree with you if you would change the, the words is resolved to can be resolved. Yes. I'm not going to, I mean, I, I would agree with you in that. I, I don't think it's required. Okay. But obviously, so, there are obviously there are mechanisms that, that, that work that way. Okay. What, what would be an example how you resolve the requirement without um, that per flow per hop state? I'm going to take the fifth on that one for the time being, as opposed to open up, open up a long discussion. Yeah, would, would, would still be helpful. I mean, if you have a reference Understood. or something. Because Understood. I, I was trying to make life easy by, by trying to come up with this simple distinction. And, uh, you know, if you want to now argue and, and kill that simple distinction, I would agree that it becomes more difficult to um, characterize large scale compared to not large scale. Yeah, um, I mean, it's... The overall concern is I'd like to avoid going back in, going back in and broadening the scope of the original debt net architecture, if I can, if I can help it. But that's just but, me. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think in the original debt net architecture, we have support for um, SR, for example, segment routing, whether it is with MPLS or IPv6, um, in which we would, uh, you know, have the path defined by the packet header. Um, and that, I think, exactly is one of the core assumptions that um, at least some of us are assuming to be used in these large-scale net nets. So I, I do think we, we do want to extend the scope of the dead net solution to allow using this mechanism. What do we do about that? 
I think we just we we to, going back to something Xu Song said earlier. I think to the extent that there's a solution, it depends on the use of segment routing. Um, I would document that dependency in 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 some sort of form of applicability, and then and then we get to figure out what to do about that in terms of which which solutions get uh, uh, get selected for what purposes. Uh, David, you mean that uh, we will try to end uh, criteria in the requirement document to say, uh, for example, whether it depends on some specific encapsulation type? I'm not, it, I, I don't uh, think requirements document. I think we need to collect our, our evaluation criteria and I think applicability in terms of applicable only to segment routing could mm -hmm. is plausibly evaluation criteria. Yeah, maybe. By the way, I don't think it is. It is. It is only right. So that, that I don't, David. I think that's not the point. I think all the mechanisms can work with per hop per flow um, steering state. That uh, basically any of the mechanisms to um, make sure that the traffic uh, for a particular dead net flow in a large or not large scale network goes across a certain path. Mm -hmm. Right. All the large scale mechanisms should be able to, to work with any of them. Mm -hmm. It is just that uh, when we have the mechanism where we use source routing, and that includes SRV6, SRMPLS, beer, potentially what we call MSR6. Um, so uh, all, all the solutions for the steering that are done for large scale networks. When we combine those, then we have a combination of header um, issue and, and question. And I think that's, that's uh, where we're trying to have to figure out whether we should keep them separate or whether we should, you know, get into the headers that already exists for the steering. And I think that, that can be dealt with um, once we un understand um, what we're trying to do with, with, with the queuing with the queuing schedule. Right. Okay. Anything else on uh, process oriented topics? Uh, I, uh, David, I have another, uh, another concern is that, uh, should we uh, have an, uh, you know, a criteria to separate the, uh, the, the work in DeadNet and the work in IEEE? Because in the previous discussion, people tend to think that the in layer two network or in a small e Ethernet network, uh, the mechanisms of queuing should be defined in uh, IEEE and uh, in IETF. We want to introduce some a uh, scalable, and uh, you know which is um, which should which could be used in layer three network mechanisms. Um, but you know it, it's kind of difficult to uh, clearly separate these mechanisms, which is only for large network, which is only for a small network. So um, I, I don't have an answer to this question. I just want to raise this up. Uh, are we um, supposed to have the criteria to have a clear um, you know, boundary with the IEEE work? Yeah. I'm yeah, not sure. To, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure about clear boundary, but it might be useful if we had some level of assurance that we are solving problems that the IEEE TSN mechanisms do not solve. And that was some of my thinking when I asked whether we ought to take the take the IEEE TSN queuing scheduling mechanisms and test run them against requirements requirements draft to convince ourselves that yeah, these we, we have requirements up above and beyond what TSN has, has considered. Oh, yes, I think that is a good point. It's kind of, uh, we, are, uh, we are raising some uh, new or some uh, IETF specific mechanism to solve the, uh, the problems that TSN existing technologies cannot solve. And I think that will make it more clear. It's like um, every new mechanism uh, is supposed to maybe compared with the traditional TS and queuing mechanisms to show their scalability or benefits. Mm -hmm. so, 
Um, so I I'd like to <laughs> um to give an example what's what what we did in in our draft for the uh, psycho ID based. Uh, uh, CQF variant. So I think actually it's a good thing that we have a very stable and good reference to the current TSN standard, which is already a published one. So everybody um, can have a better can take a can take a look at it and have a very good understanding of it. And at the same time, we have the requirement document. So um, in our proposed solution, actually we try to say uh, what need to be addressed in order to meet this uh, requirement documents. For example, uh, in order to meet that loose requirement for the strict time synchronization, uh, to meet the uh, long hop uh, requirements, to support long hop requirements in larger scale network. Th these, are, um, these are parts that not addressed in current published fundamental CQF. So, so um, I think that is, as long as we say, okay, the reference point is the, uh, is, is the, um, is a well-known one, is a, is a very stable one. Then for me, I think the, uh, the difference or the so-called boundary is, is clear for me to, at least from the uh, TCQ of LCQ of Orion point of view. Uh, but at the same time, I, this remind me something else. There, there are so many papers in the market, in the academy, uh, always give uh, all kinds of different queuing or scheduling mechanism. So, sure. so what, uh, so it's, it's quite not possible, it's not possible that we standardize everything. So, uh, what's considered to be a stable reference, uh, what's considered may not be so so stable, that uh, that could be something uh, a little bit vague. So that's that would be considered later when we are trying to evaluate each of the solutions. Yes, for, um, for other solutions, queuing mechanisms, how, how we use a requirement drop to really test run with the Tianzhen mechanism. Uh, should they also put this work, uh, their work to H4E? Or do they ha have any ways to do that? Because uh, for uh, CQF or TCQF, uh, there is a reference, but for some of, of the others, there's no reference, I think, in Tianzhen. I don't. I don't think that's a problem. I don't. I think that I think it's fine for IETF to publish uh, publish a queuing algorithm like here here as an RFC. I don't think it's any required requirement to get uh, get IEEE to publish first uh, to, to publish some piece of first. Well. Uh, so what what uh, should we do with the requirement draft for itself? Is there any, any big videos? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Uh, David, I think uh, Peng's question is that uh, do we need to end some uh, criteria or this? descriptions in the requirement document about this. No, 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 uh, I, I don't mean <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I agree that uh, with the uh, third uh, point that evaluation uh, uh, should be end of the requirement draft. I, I mean, just for uh, the uh, current version of the requirement draft, is there any big uh, issues sh uh, should be addressed? Oh, 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 okay. Just to let me, update let me, it. I don't know. Let me make, let me turn that around and make that a request to the working group. In order to make some progress here, we're going to have to, to, to declare the requirements draft is stable in a good enough form fairly soon. We'd like to do that uh, by, uh, by the first part of May. So if you have any, any major concerns with the requirements draft, now, would be a good time to raise. It could be done here. Could be could be done in the list, because about a month from now we're probably going to be looking at that and saying, okay, that's that's defining at least the, the the first set of requirements we have to evaluate against. Keeping in mind 
that there'll be a separate set of evaluation criteria for things like difficulty of, of uh, difficulty or feasibility of implementation. Sure, um, we will just uh, looking to refine it. I think maybe within one or two weeks, I'll propose some 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 maybe minor changes of the requirement draft to the mailing list. Okay. Anything else, or should we proceed with uh, one of the in-depth presentations? I hear silence. So, as you know, I hope I hope I hope I haven't too badly mispronounced your name. I think you're on for about uh, thirty minutes on the asynchronous framework. I will stop sharing because you're going to because you're going to want to share slides. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Tino. Yeah. So um, just give me a second. Uh, I'm figuring how I can share the screen. It should be a green icon at the bottom of your screen that says share screen. Well, I'm running on Windows. I don't know what other people are running. Oh, on. Yeah. Um, I, I just found it. Okay. And you can share your whole screen or share a window. Mm -hmm. So um, I just shared my screen. Uh, I hope you all can share, see the slides I have made. Yes. Okay. So uh, I will talk about the, the ADM framework document. Uh, in about 30 minutes. Okay, so uh, we are in the revision two now. Uh, so the overview of the framework draft, uh, it has two parts. The first one is the latency guarantee framework. And second one is the jitter guarantee framework. So they are all uh, independent solutions. The framework latency uh, framework for latency guarantees also two part. The first part is based on the regulation function, similar to the ATS in the TSN. The second part is the recently developed one. Uh, it is based on the packet metadata. And currently it has only one solution, uh, so-called work conserving stateless core fair tree. Uh, I will refer it as syscore from now on. And today's focus is on this syscore and the so-called buffered network framework for JITA guarantee. And especially, uh, I will talk about the operational procedures uh, in detail. Uh, I hope that uh, if the operational procedure is well understood, um, all the uh, the pros and cons will be revealed, and we can you can all see clearly the the advantages or disadvantages of these words. So this is uh, syscore. The framework is very simple. Uh, it is um, hi, oh, okay. hi, Jin. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, if if we have any questions, would you like to leave it uh, on the end of the presentation or? raised uh, during your your presentation? Oh, I'd like to hear the questions uh, immediately. <laughs> but um, in order uh, to, yeah. I have to be interrupted. So you can just stop me. Yeah, uh, you can just stop yeah. me. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, that's great. I have some questions in your previous uh, slide for Pre your previous, yeah. Uh, uh, you have mentioned uh, three algorithms algorithm here, right? ATS, FAIR, and the PFAR. Uh, my question is that because ATS is, uh, you know, it's um, uh, quite um, normal concept and which has um, discussed 
in IEEE or some previous work. Uh, I'm wondering whether the ATS is the base of your discussion and the FAIR and PFAR is the, uh, is the, is the uh, new mechanisms you are trying to propose. I'm, uh, am I understanding this right? Yes, yes, you are correct. It is very well known. And these two other uh, solutions, which yeah. I think of them as the extension of the ATS or the general generalization of the ATS. So these three are basically in the, have the same principle. And uh, I would say about the similar performance uh, with each other, but they have all their pros and cons. Uh, yeah, for example, the the last solution P far uh, mm -hmm. doesn't have to uh, maintain the flow state, but it has yeah. slightly less performance and so on. Yeah. Okay. I actually what I'm trying to ask is that uh, this work is the the summary of the uh, a synchronized uh, traffic shaping mechanisms. Or it is, um, you know, the it's kind of uh, uh, trying to raise new mechanisms and to solve the existing problem of the asynchronized mechanisms. Oh yeah, that's the very good question, and I had to uh, mention it a long, long time ago. Actually, the scope of this draft is to provide the general framework. Um, that's why the older uh, relative solutions are listed. Mm -hmm. And a common part has been summarized. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in the future, in a near future, the mm -hmm. packet data based solutions, one or more solution can be listed other than this is core. So it tries to grab the entire dimension of the let's say, asynchronous solutions, which are based on the cell multiplexing and regulators and so on. But if, uh, if we were to uh, try to say we have um, particular proposals that we would like to see um, for the large scale, to, to meet the large scale DECnet, then um, ultimately <clears throat> your first preference would be for that to be C-score and any of the other, you know, uh, um, ATS derivations are, you know, not your preferred solutions. But if if the working group feels they're worthwhile, then they, they could be put on the table. But here, they're just more or less for reference as, uh, you know, earlier steps towards C-score. Is that a correct understanding? Yes, yes, right. Totally. Yeah, uh, you're correct. So um, as, a, as a one of the members of the academy, um, I feel that uh, every solutions people propose has some advantages in some area. So uh, for me, uh, preference is not uh, given to any of these because the regulation-based solution has its own advantages. Uh, I, I will try to just list the possible effective and efficient solutions as many as possible. That's the scope of this document. And because, because of that, it's just the uh, informational one, not the standard trend. OK, um, I hope that answered your questions. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Gino. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. So the World Conserving Stateless Core Fail King, Syscore, uh, has a simple framework, uh, which is based on the finish time. Um, uh, finish time is kind of uh, uh, ideal service finish time, ideal service completion time in a flu fluid model, ideal fluid model. Um, and the uh, how it can be obtained, uh, you can see in the next clip. Um, so uh, in this framework, uh, we see the en entire network as two parts. The first one is the entrance node or edge node or boundary node. They maintain the flow state. 
and obtain their uh, finish time with this equation. Um, okay, I'm not going to the detail of the equation. You can see the symbols and definitions on the right side. And at the core node, um, this finish time is updated with DHP. Uh, we, we call it a delay factor. And if you choose the delay factor with these uh, red letters, L max divided by R plus L divided by R. So if this DHP is carefully chosen such, uh, such as this, then the end to end latency is bounded with this equation. Uh, if you look at this equation very carefully, um, the B, L, R are all flow specific. And if the source wants, uh, they can change the parameter. For example, you can reduce your own burst maximum burst size, then you can reduce your uh, latency bound as well. The only term that is external and cannot be controlled the source or the flow itself is the L max and large R H. So this cannot be controlled. L max H is the maximum pack length over all the flows in the node H. And RH is the link capacity of the node H. So this cannot be controlled by uh, flow itself, but uh, because the large R is very large compared to the small R, and uh, small R is the service rate of the flow, this term is uh, kind of very small, can, can be negligible in some sense, like uh, 10, G, 10 gigabps or 100 gigabps uh, link, this term becomes very small and all parameters are closed HP. So you can control your latency bound. That's the, that's the key benefit. So we call it such a property as a flow, flow protection. So it has the very good flow protection uh, property. So um, the next slide. Uh, this I listed the operational procedure in detail uh, about the syscore. The first, uh, the network has to be configured. Uh, as we just briefly mentioned about the resource reservation, the resource reservation is necessary in this case as well. So how it goes, uh, the source requests latency bound with the so-called a T spec traffic specification, maximum burst size, and the uh, average arrival rates. And the network configures that it can be met, the latency round can be met, then admit the flow, and reserve the link uh, in the path of the flow such that the service rate is greater than the arrival rate. And the sum of the all the flows uh, service rates is less than the link capacity. Um, these mathematical terms can be complicated, so I just listed the symbols uh, on the right. So this, I think this is a rather simple uh, letter configuration con compared to the slotted operations. Uh, what is necessary for the uh, slotted operation, the network configuration can be very complicated. But compared to that, uh, it has a simpler network configuration stage. And uh, after doing that, uh, the on the packet transmission stage uh, or packet treatment stage, the entrance node uh, or the source itself have all the complexity. It has to maintain the flow state. Here, uh, as E.G. E said, the flow state is rather a simple one. In this case, uh, F0, uh, P minus one is the flow state. Uh, it is the um, finish time of the previous packet of that flow is the representative of the flow state. So it has to maintain that value. 
and the flow service rate. It has to remember the flow service rate. So these two values represent the flow state. And the source or the entrance node has to maintain a clock for, for knowing the current time. And it has to maintain the link information, uh, especially the LMAX divided by R, large R. So based on this information, upon receiving or uh, if the source is uh, the the source acts as the entrance node. The source generates the packet as upon the generating packet T, it obtains the initial uh, finish time with this equation, and use it as the finish time in node H, and put P put the packet in the sorted queue, and in the meantime uh, you can calculate the finish time to be used in the next node with the local information and the full specific information. So uh, you can record the F1P and L divided by R in the packet as metadata for the use in the next node. So these two are the specific metadata that is needed. Other than that, uh, nothing is necessary. And uh, while the packet is in the queue, or before putting into the queue, uh, the flow state has to be updated to the new one uh, instead of the old one. So this the okay. Hi, hi, Gino. I I want to make it more clear. Uh, the the meaning of F1P is uh, first time our packet P uh, at node H, right? This is the first time? Um, yeah, um, H is uh, uh, any arbitrary node in the core or, um, yeah, H is the node in an arbitrary position. Uh, what was the question? Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to know is the metadata you mentioned here is the, is the thing that uh, is the information that should be maintained in the packet or maintained in the node? Oh, uh, when I say metadata, it is, uh, encode, it is something encoded in the packet. It is oh, encoded in the packet. Yeah, okay. Okay. Maybe so the, the packet metadata, so then. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, understood. So the F is the, the time and the, the L is the, the packet length. That yes. is, the, the, each packet will take these two parameters in the encapsulation. Yes, yes. Because in um, the time, we don't have uh -huh. any of the flow, so all the information has to be retrieved from the packet itself. So L divided by small r uh, should be also uh, Encoded as a metadata. Yeah, so that that makes me a little confused because um, uh, if we want to eliminate the the flow identification, um, we just take the information in each packet. It's kind of the the traffic uh, traffic specification of the flow is not um, functioning. It's like the, the per per packet behavior um, is used to to guarantee the bounded latency. So the finished time of packet, how how do we know that? Is that a kind of um, latency expectation for each hop? Oh yes. Um, okay, I'll I'll go back to the previous slide and. Uh -huh. Uh, can you see the red dotted cursor that I'm moving around? Yes, yes. Oh, that's great. So um, this is the equation I want you to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so in the entrance node, uh -huh. is the F0, F sub 0, P minus 1 is the flow state. Yes. So based on the flow state, uh, FT is calculated. But in the corner, don't want to 
maintain the flow state. So instead of using the flow state, we just use the metadata. This is the metadata. So you can think of it that way. Oh. The same P is moving around from H1 to H. This metadata is constantly updated from F H minus one P to F H P. But oh, okay. <laughs> so you mean that it is updated by the previous node and it can be used in the existing node? Great. Yes, that's right. Oh, okay. So the HP isn't shown here on the right hand side. Which one is on the right? DHP. I think that's the delay somehow. Oh, D. Oh, yeah, I missed it. Uh, sorry. So is that <laughs> the delay or? Yeah, this is the. Uh, yeah, this is a very important concept of this framework. You can call it uh, any way you want, but I call it a delay factor. Okay. It represents the, the delay caused uh, in the previous node. So uh, here in this specific uh, choice of the DHP, this is um, what we should consider as the representative delay experienced by the packet P at node H minus one. So this L minus R uh, represent the transmission delay. Uh, in con in concept, and this L max divided by R is uh, something like you have to wait at your turn, but some some error is being served. Some some packet is being served, um, so you you have to wait until that uh, service that packet service is completed. So this is the this is. Actually, this represented this expression is a famous one. This is called service latency of a node. It is very well uh, known expression. Um, yeah. So, in essence, the flows, uh, the uh, the package finish time is updated every node with the delay factor. But uh, what delay factor you choose? That's the problem in this framework. But it turns out the whatever the delay factor is, um, this framework gives you a very good performance. It can be shown. It has been shown through the simulation that I want to talk about in today's talk. Yes, okay. I think it. So I, I mean, you you you've given these slides um, a, a few times, and it, it would help to maybe you know try to uh, do a. Uh, um, a slide more from the perspective what you know the forwarding plane would need to do right so the way I understand it um, there seems to be two packet metadata fields if you go back to the to the other slide mm -hmm. um, which is here the, the the packet meta third line from the bottom right retrieve packet metadata FHP and L divided by R mm -hmm. so so this FHP is the treatment of the packet kind of ultimately up to the prior hop mm -hmm. and then the effectively the, the rate factor, so to speak, this L divided by R, what you call it. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, L divided by R has to be used in calculation of the next finish right. time. This, this to be used here in this equation. Right. So does the mechanism actually require you to, I mean, so you, you put it in a PIFO, right? So an ordered, ordered queue um, by mm -hmm. ordered by that uh, FH plus one P. Um, how does the actual um, uh, departure time, I mean, just, just because you did calculate a, a particular departure order, doesn't doesn't indicate whether or not there was a queue being built up, right? So um, if you have a burst collision at a point in time, then the packet will be departing the router much later than uh, if there was no burst collision, right? So how does the account, the algorithm 
need to take or not take that into account? Oh yeah, um, the, there are relations uh, that have been found, uh, the relationship between the actual service completion time and the finish time that is uh, kind of ideal one. And uh, yeah, uh, and those kind of relationship has been uh, found already. And yeah, uh, what, what was the question again? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying, does the actual departure time uh, need to be uh, uh, tracked or measured somehow in the mechanism? Oh, yeah, 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 that can be done. That can be done. And because of that property, this, this uh, endotent latency is also bounded. The... But I don't see it in the algorithm, right? In the algorithm, wait a second. So you are, can you go back to the prior slide again? So wait a second. So so you're calculating FH plus one P and you're only updating that metadata field, right? So you have two packet metadata fields, L divided by R, which is fixed, which is a parameter of the flow uh, that the packet belongs to. And then FH uh, P, and that is updated on every hop, but it's calculated only um, before you, it, it can be calculated only before you insert the packet into the PIFO and doesn't need to change uh, at the point in time when the packet is released from the PIFO, right? Right, exactly. That's right. So this calculation can be um, beforehand, before the packet is being enqueued or uh, before, uh, long before its transmission. Actually, the... well, where, where does the C-score come from? I mean, w w at which point in, in time was this mechanism invented? It was invented in early 2000. Oh, wow. Early 2000. But uh, it has not been accepted because it needs to uh, maintain the metadata, uh, which was not accepted at the time, I, as, I, as I remember, if, uh, if David... Uh, remembers, then uh, I would be happy. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, it has not been accepted. Hey, hey Gino, you are uh, sorted queue. Uh, is that a shared queue among all the flows? Or each flow uh, gets its own queue? That's a very good question as well. Um, a, a sorted queue can be implemented in many ways, very, very many ways. It, uh, it has been a research topic for about uh, more than 10 years. Here, um, the sorted queue can be placed in, uh, per input port, for example. And then okay. the end of the queue of those sorted queue can be compared. That's a one example of implementation. But if you do not use per, ser uh, per service flow queue, here one assumption you are using for the F H plus one P, in the calculation, you have assumption for any packet you put in the queue, there will be at most one packet in front of you. That's correct, yeah. So, but if you do not have a per flow queue, it's not right. So when you put a packet into the queue, you may have more than one in front of you. You mean uh, per flow? You mean right, a... suppose here, well, suppose you have 10 flows and sharing one queue, and now a packet from uh, flow one coming in, and then you try to get FH plus one. But mm -hmm. here, if well, after your calculation, you put this packet into like a third position, into the sorted sharing queue. Okay. So that means you're going to have two other packets in front of you. But they, these must be from other flows. Right. But then when you do the calculation, the second line from the bottom, you have L max over RH. That assumption is only for one largest packet to be decued or transmitted. Only one at the most, the worst case. But you have two actually in the queue in front of you. So look at the second line from the bottom. FHP is a given from the metadata. But the L max H over R H is an assumption for the upper bound of a single packet in front I'm of you. Sure. 
I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. Actually, uh, the, the this equation for yeah. f plus one is a uh, finish time. Yeah, this will be used in the next node. Right, understand. That calculation is right, but the thing is the assumption for the calculation. The second term in the formula, L max H over RH is the bound for one largest packet that's going to cost you, which is in front of you in the sort hit queue. The, wor the worst okay. case bound. So if you have two largest, suppose you have there are two packets with the largest lens in front of you. Here, you're going to have two, two times of this one. That's why I'm asking you, how is the sorted queue is uh, established? It's like a per service flow queue or it's a shared queue? Um, sorry, I, I cannot quite- Okay, sure, no problem. We, we can discuss we offline. Just off, offline, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, if you can elaborate your question, maybe through the email, uh, I will. Uh... Sure, sure. Yes. But maybe, maybe um, this, this, this. I, I, I don't claim I fully understand the math, right? But the uh, the maximum packet size of any flow on the outgoing interface is a classical parameter that tells you the worst case serialization delay that you may need to wait longer. Uh, on the outgoing interface before you can be served. So if that's what the math is built on, then this too is a parameter that uh, doesn't uh, need to be carried by the flow or something like that, but which just has to be pre-configured. So if, if, if we can have any flow that can, let's say have 1500, which is the maximum packet size then for the outgoing interface, um, that would be uh, then the parameter 1500. For, for the formula. Um, and of course, if uh, we would, and, and I guess if, if you put this parameter in and all the flows have a shorter maximum packet size, then you are just, uh, I guess, overestimating the maximum latency on that hop. Um, and so your bounded latency becomes larger than it would actually need to be in practice. Can we let, let the junior get, get on with the uh, yep. uh, with the presentation? Chanji's yep. question is interesting. I think taking the list would be would, would be good. He's essentially asking what is what what's the scope of the sorted queue? Yeah, oh, I, I can pull down the email about that. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, answering to the totalless question, yes, uh, this this value uh, is not metadata. It it is maintained within the node and used uh, for this equation, if that was the question. And about the detailed uh, calculation or calculus regarding this uh, latency bound, uh, it is very hard for me to explain in, with this uh, presentation slide in these uh, mathematical equations. So I would prefer it to be uh, postponed uh, with the email discussion. I think your presentation is clear. Well, I I will see, I understand, but I have a question really with that sort of key because it gave me some mathematic uh, ambiguity. So, yeah. Thank okay, you. Yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the, uh, let's say, this is the original C score. But as you can see, it, it needs uh, sort of queue in the core. And I think it can be uh, it can be a kind of a holding factor, limiting factor. Now currently, uh, as, as far as I know, uh, 10 gigabps line speed can be served, the sorted queue. But more than that, I'm not sure. So uh, if 10 gigabps, we, we, if you need more than 10 gigabps, then we can have an alternative with using FITFO. Actually, all the operational procedures in page four and page five are identical, except those uh, red letters. I won't go into the detail because I have uh, covered once. But here, 
um, the metadata, the metadata includes three terms. Instead of L minus R, we need L and R in order to specify the flow type of that packet belongs to. And the key idea here is that the, the fecal people, first in, first out, Q, are assigned for the is assigned for the flows of the same or similar type. And this is the one example of implementation. Well, so when you say preemption, I'm getting worried that IEEE has preemption where you really, you know, are cutting a, a packet that's being serialized short. Is that what you're trying to imply? Uh, actually, um, yeah, that's a good point here. Here, uh, so far, we've been only talking about the high priority flows. That's the one of the assumption in the in this frame of draft. How about low priority packets? That's uh, out of scope. So one simple way of putting a uh, low priority packet uh, is to place them in the strict priority schedule with preemption. That's the simplest approach you can take. But if preemption is not available, we can still just work with strict strict priority scheduler. And in the in that case, the end-to-end -end latency yes. is increased, but that is uh, predictable. So we can work around even without the preemption. So please do not uh, take too much consideration about this part. No, it would just be good to have the math that you present and document for the case where we do not have packet preemption, right? Because I think in general, we wouldn't mm -hmm. like to assume that we can have it in our .NET uh, hops. Uh, in that case, if the preemption is not allowed, then this bound, you can uh, you can add one more L max. Right. This becomes two L max. Yeah. It, it is increasing, but not that much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for pointing out that. So. Uh, this is the main, this part is the main concern. So the high priority packets comes in, then the metadata are retrieved, these metadata retrieved and updated like that. And based on that uh, uh, finish time value and the, the flow, oh, oh, sorry, not, not based on this finish time value, based on this L and R, identify which queue to be put in and those packets that have similar or same L and R will be put into the FIFO queue. So, um, and FIFO queue is examined until the HOQ uh, is reached. Head of queue, uh, the selector, this, the selector examines the head of the queue packets there finish times, and then choose the, the packet with the minimum uh, finish time and serve it. That's the one uh, way of implementing with B4. And uh, through the extensive simulation, we have shown that uh, this v based architecture gives a very similar performance with the original C-score. But is but there a calculus that proves that it is uh, still bounded? Uh, no. Uh, I'm trying to find out. I'm trying to find out, but I, I, I didn't have it right away. Right. Um, do, do, do you know, um, it, um, given that red letters, because kind of aggregate, try to aggregate uh, the flows of the same or similar type, uh, is uh, am I right to say that it's used quite a similar concept that the current uh, ADS tried to use because uh, there is a there is a term called group eligibility time. Of course, here you are using you you are, you are, you, are, you are using the finish time, not the eligibility time. But uh, uh, the group eligibility time used in ATS also try to group um, multiple flows with the same or similar type. Uh, so that 
uh, FIFO queues can be used instead of the PIFO. So I'm not, I'm, uh, it looks to me they are follow the same concept or logic. If if it is, maybe uh, that is, I, I, yeah, from what I heard, it looks like uh, there may not be a mathematical uh, proof right now, but uh, um, it looks like there is a, a parallel art already doing this. Yeah, uh, that's a very good observation. But uh, ATS, as far as I understood, uh, allocate five or queues per input port. So all the all the flows or all the packets from the same input port are put into the same FIFO. And they okay. the packet from the input port, same port, goes to the up until HOQ, head of the queue. And the, the examiner or the regulator mm -hmm. examines its eligibility. This, Whether... In your case, is there actually the, when you're saying, you're sending out based on um, the uh, minimum um, uh, rank here. Um, is that also time based? I mean, uh, are you are you delaying a packet to be sent out based on that control parameter? No, or no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do not delay here. Uh, it's a work conserving schedule. It's very important. It's, it's a work conserving. And you so, don't have the issue that uh, you would be sending out a packet with one particular eligibility parameter and then later on you get a packet um, shortly thereafter you get a packet that would have an even earlier um, eligibility uh, parameter um the eligibility is not a proper wording here um okay yeah the finish time is kind of service order but it has the unit of time yes it has but, but you, you, so you get it so finish time sorry I'm, I'm i'm learning the vocabulary right so you have one packet you calculate the finish uh, time um, it is immediately served because there is no competing packet and immediately afterwards you get a packet for which you would have uh, for which you'll calculate an even earlier eligibility uh, finish time sorry finish time and yeah, now you did not send them out in the order because that other packet that was can sent happen first. that can happen yes that can happen. The, the packet arrived later can have a smaller FT. That can happen. So in that case, their finish time is switched. And that doesn't cause problems for the bounded latency? Yeah, that, that factor has been uh, considered for the bounded latency. Okay. Okay, thank you for the questions. So. Yeah, these two are the main part. Um, so this is the summary. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I I won't go into detail. Uh, it, it can be boring. So this is the so far we've been talking about the syscore and David. Do I have some more time? I think I spent too much time. Uh, you spent too much time because you asked you, you got asked too many questions, which is a good reason to use too much time. I would suggest you keep going, and we'll take up uh, Peng's draft in the next meeting. Okay, uh, I think time's okay. better better spent on a de on the detailed explanation you're providing. Thank you. Okay, thank uh, thank you, David. And sorry, I shall for, for my no, no, it's okay. It's it, it's okay. You you got asked a bunch of, a bunch of good detailed questions, which was the goal of this. Great, thank you. So this is the Gito guarantee framework. Uh, I call it buffered network, but okay. Uh, somebody asked, no, okay. So basic idea here. So this is a completely different one from the syscore. It is it is completely independent. So it's a completely different one that only focuses on the GTA guarantee. The basic idea here is that uh, reproducing the inter arrival inter uh, packet inter-arrival process with the packet inter-departure process out of a network. So if you are familiar with the, the playback buffer that, that is usually uh, implemented in the application layer, actually this is very similar idea. 
um, you can see the you can see the diagram on the right bottom. Uh, it has uh, source, destination, and network. And in between the source and the network, there is a functional entity uh, timestamp called timestamp. And in between the network and the destination, there is a functional entity uh, called buffer. So this functional entity is uh, not an actual device, but a conceptual one. So it can be, the timestamp can be within the source or within the network, at the network boundary or edge network or whatever you call it or entrance node. The buffer is similar to be placed within the destination or the network edge. So what, what the timestamp does is just the stamping the time uh, of the arrival from the source or the uh, entrance time of, into the network. So it depends. It depends on how you uh, define your jitter. Anyway. Uh, the time stamper stamps the time and buffer holds the packet uh, according to these rules. Um, again, these mathematical formulations are hard to explain, but here uh, the key element is the M, which is the jitter control parameter. If the M is small, you don't control much, but M is large, becomes larger, then you control M, hold the packet longer. And you can even uh, make the jitter zero if you set this M to be large enough. Here, U, large U, is the end to end latency upper bound from here to here, from here to here. So um, yeah, U is the network latency of bound. So what the network has to do is to uh, guarantee the latency. That's the only thing that network has to do. And if you follow these rules, uh, for some uh, for some boring calculation, the end-to-end -end jitter is upper bounded. Uh, and return the jitter is defined with this equation. So C, yeah, uh, you can take a look uh, later. And and return the buffer latency that is from here to here, not from here to here. The buffered latency from here to here, from C N to A N, is also upper bounded. But you can see that the M is the added factor here. So if you choose the larger M, for example, to be this one, then, then the end to end, the buffered latency bound becomes larger, like the twice of the original one. So this is the price you have to pay. And this, um, yeah, uh, this is the basic uh, framework. And the operation procedure is rather very simple. Um, Actually, I don't have much, much thing to explain. The timestamp has to maintain a clock, but that does not need to be synced with any other nodes. So um, it has its own clock, and that's it. That's, uh, that's what all is needed. And the timestamps, the packet upon, uh, if it is the source, if it is within the source upon generation, and if it is in the entrance node of the network, it can be the arrival of the packet. And the network does nothing, but it has to guarantee the latency bound. Um, yeah, one more thing the network has to do, I just forgot, is to uh, acknowledge the value of U and W. This is upper bound and this is the lower bound. Uh, here, the lower bound usually means the propagation delay from here to here. Uh, usually means that. But anyway, these two value has to be acknowledged to the buffer. Yeah, that's what the network has to do. Uh, I had to mention it, sorry. Hmm. Anyway, and the buffer holds the packet according to the rule in the previous page. And then uh, when it's eligible, it releases to the destination. So that's it, that's, that's all we have to do.
we can we can control those details, but uh, there's a small price to pay. The timestamping can be um, cumbersome. Yes, I agree with that. But it is very similar to the one-step P2P. And but it's not upon a package transmission. So if the source stamps, then uh, it stamps when it is generated. And if the entrance node stamps, then it can be done upon the packet arrival. So the, the timing constraint is much relaxed, I would say. Um, the stamped time can be placed in the RTP timestamp field. Uh, I'm not so sure about this, yeah. Or um, put it in the packet header as the metadata. Uh, if we combine this solution with the syscore, this current time or packet arrival time to the entrance node is already maintained by the syscore. So it doesn't have that much burden. Okay, um, yeah, this is it. Thank you for all your um, attention. Thank you very much. Want to hear okay. some comments on this or should we take it to email? I just to... Co comments are welcome. We have another 20 minutes and I was going to sort of quick insert myself. Maybe that's, that's a little presumptuous and presumptuous of me. So uh, Trilis, you want to go ahead? Yeah, so I so I mean, um, I think uh, a year or two when we started these discussions, um, I I also proposed the idea of of having what I would call such a you know network assisted playout buffer mechanism to eliminate the yeah, jitter, I right? Um, and I, I think I think uh, that may be a worthwhile thing to do. Obviously, it would be great to separate this out from the uh, you know specific asynchronous mechanism because it's applicable to all of them. So that we wouldn't have to tie it to one of them. Um, the the main thing that that I would like to point out is that I try to make a big um, concern about uh, the need to introduce um, this um, frequency synchronization back into the network to support this mechanism. Um, especially because after I talked to PTP experts and they pretty much told me that while in theory you could have simpler frequency synchronization than clock synchronization practice. This isn't anywhere in the PTP profiles or uh, the chips being done. So ultimately you end up uh, with the same complexity in, in the setup for PTP that you do for clock synchronization. So my, my suggested way to solve this is, is to really consider that we have metadata in the packet that is uh, simply accumulating the propagation latency through the network by simply every hop doing the measurement of the latency on the hop, right? So that way we wouldn't need to have any, you know, synchronization. We simply add up the, the propagation latency and uh, eliminate the uh, the cost of uh, of this mechanism, in my opinion, to the largest extent. Yes, yes, uh, that's very, uh, yeah, that's a very good observation and I, I appreciate your comment. Actually, um, this solution requires, or uh, the re it is recommended to have the frequency synchronization. Uh, yes, that's, that's true. So what we have come up with is that uh, compensation, there is a compensation algorithm, uh, even without the uh, frequency synchronization, that is, yeah. We have, sorry, we have come up with an algorithm that uh, compensate the frequency or clock draft, clock drift. Yeah, but uh, it turns out that there there can be many uh, workaround. To if we, we utilize the packet metadata, then there must be uh, some good solution or better solution. I've been I've been thinking about it. I will think about it. Thank you very much. Well, I think the main point is that uh, with this mechanism that treats the uh, network cloud itself as not really being involved, right? So you're inserting a timestamp in the beginning and then you're doing play out buffering on the receiver side, whether it's the last hop router or the destination itself, that's a deployment thing. That's, that, that's a nice scheme, but uh, yeah. So I think one would have to look at the overall operational cost of uh, getting 
you know, frequency synchronization or a workaround uh, into into the network, right? And I was I was rather saying that um, if we already have the you know, uh, non, so we don't need clock synchronization on a per hop basis for the asynchronous uh, queuing, right? And we equally do not need to have clock synchronization um, or, you know, frequency synchronization, any of that for the per hop measurement of latency, right? Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, I think we do not need to make the assumption that the, the hop by hop behavior to give us, um, uh, asynchronous uh, uh, guaranteed latency um, would not also be able to measure the propagation latency and put it in the metadata. And as soon as we put it in the metadata field, the measured latency hop by hop, then we have eliminated uh, the, the big challenge of this mechanism. Right, right, right. That's true. But in, in some sense, measuring an actual delay in a hop and put it in the packet that's quite challenging, I think. Measuring the exact delays can be cumbersome or difficult, but put it, put it in the packet at the last moment of the transmission, that is very difficult, I would say. So uh, yeah, let, let's think about that. Oh, so this, can... this is definitely the, 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 the new thing to, to um really you know uh, put up for for review and i would be <laughs> would love to fight for it so first of all obviously the same thing is done for ptp packets themselves and secondly i think we're also seeing from other mechanisms like the aqm mechanisms mm -hmm. that uh, we are starting to introduce more operations in the dequeuing slash uh, serialization point in time as opposed to only during the enqueuing time right so I would I would argue that uh, <clears throat> doing a simple um, you know uh, math operation on the on the metadata field, which is to you know um, uh, subtract the the arrival time from the departure time um, and add that uh, to the metadata field, I think that should be well feasible for for future hardware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree to that. I, I agree to you that that is feasible in the near future or maybe currently. But I have been discussing this issue with some other person from the TSN group. Uh, some of them say the PTP is um, just for special small number packets. But here, the within the deadnet yes. scope, yes, every packet has to be marked, right? Yes. Yes. There's a completely different story. That's what uh, he argued about. I I'm not so sure about it anyway. Yeah. There is such an opinion. Oh no, that 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 definitely would be exactly one of those uh, things uh, to 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 really work out. But ultimately, I don't really see much of a difference of doing you know these complex calculation that, for example, uh, your uh, C scope um, al algorithm is doing on the end queuing time versus the dequeuing time. It just has traditionally, you know, never been done. So whenever you talk to somebody. Uh, rooted in traditional hardware, it, it, it very much comes as a surprise, but we've gone through similar surprises in many of the uh, newer AQM mechanisms, which do introduce additional operation at the dequeuing time. Okay, yeah, I agree to that. Thank you, your comment, Turles. Mm -hmm. So, Turles, I caution that your, your discussion about accumulating time uh, seem to center on node entry and node exit, assuming that all of the interesting time is is, is in the nodes. Uh, wireless links in particular can have yes. variable propagation time. Yes. So, I mean, I've, I've, I've been, uh, you know, uh, yesterday been starting to write up some, some review of, of, of this draft and I was putting that down there in so far as that um, obviously my uh, main background comes from um, networks that have wonderful uh, low um, link jitter usually, um, but of course I'm also aware of exactly these uh, yes. link jitter uh, networks, right? So there, I think there are exactly these two core ones. The one is radio links um, with retransmission, especially which you don't see at the forwarding layer because they're you know in the subnet, and the other one actually is also a coax um, on uh, poles that becomes longer and shorter based on temperature, which is a very long-term change, but nevertheless, it, it, it is jitter. 
Um, so yeah, so we would have to uh, consider um, if or how um, that can be included in the framework. Um, and, and I would say that um, if, if you have um, complex links with complex behaviors, especially radio, I think um, they, you know, if a Wi-Fi link can already do retransmission and all that stuff, right? They can easily also add up the uh, the mechanism for that link to measure its propagation latency, and put that uh, and and make that available for the forwarding layer. I mean, it's it's just the, the operationalizing PTP as a network wide service or. NTP, right? Depending on you know what accuracy you need. If you if you read papers, for example, uh, about how they're operationalizing this in the you know um, energy networks, right, where they're distributing electricity and need very good accuracy, especially to measure latency over links um, and therefore the length of cables or so, right. So that's that's a big operational. Uh, thing that uh, so far has only been agreed upon in very sh uh, small um, parts of, of larger networks with the accuracy that we would need uh, in, in this, such as the front hall, right, which is one or two hops, but it wouldn't expand, I think, reasonably into the desired operational um, environments of, let's say, a whole metro network. That, that's my big concern why I'd rather like to see new new hardware to be built to, uh, for, for those larger networks than try to assume that we get things deployed with the uh, clock synchronization requirement. And obviously that's completely opposite to, for example, what Jakob Stein would say, but he's very much focused when we last talked on that front hall use case for, for their products, right? So it pretty much depends on what you consider to be the network of interest. Any more questions or comments for uh, Jinder? Um, I have a question. So for this, it looks like the bounded jitter is it how, how is it how, is it relevant to the earlier bounded latency? Uh, I mean, for example, the jitter control parameters or this kind of thing will will impact will or will not impact the the finishing time introduced earlier. Uh no. No. no, so they are completely separate. Yeah, they are independent with each other. Yeah. So as Torales uh, commented before, uh, whatever the latency guarantee mechanism is, this buffered network concept can be applied. Yeah, I would say that. And I think Torales got most of the point I was going to make, which is that this is, this is one of a class of techniques um, that are known that in effect trade jitter, jitter away for uh, for uh, for more latency because the the buffer in 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 effect is turning jitter in the network into into what is perceived as latency through the network by the destination. Yes, uh, that's exactly true. So uh, yeah, <laughs> you can you can think of this whole draft is the uh, revival of the classical concept you know everything except the ATS itself uh, here the regulation itself the the finished time concept and the playback holder um, yeah this is all classical that's a good point thank you Okay, then um, I think I will stop uh, sharing the presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, so thank you. And, and Shafu, apologies to you that we had uh, way too much discussion. So we'll give you a full uh, time slot next next time rather than trying to ask you to suddenly shorten 30, minute, 30 minutes so that you can hear it to 10. Okay, so uh, at this time, we'll kind of continue to take a short uh, presentation. Um, I think what, what, what would be better would be to, 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 to give you 45 minutes to an hour of the next meeting for the full presentation. Um, I think one of the problems we're trying to solve with these long time slots is we keep asking people to do, to do 
15 or 10 or eight minute presentations in the meetings. And that's, that, that's just really not enough time to do a good job of explanation and to deal to, to deal with the question. So I think next time, and uh, uh, appreciate your patience. We, we, we will give, give you 45 minutes to an hour. Okay, somebody understand. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Oh, just logistics wise, you know, um, I think next time we should use a notes.itf page or so. So I did try to start with some notes, but couldn't continue much with uh, while we were discussing this. Um, so um, I took a bunch of private notes. I'm going to dump some of them into, into the wiki to the extent I can. Yes, the, the, the hedge doc, uh, 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 editor that allows collaboration, collaboration built to be simply better than a wiki to which you have to submit changes. Okay, if there's nothing else, I think we're done. Thank just, you all very just, much for taking. Go ahead. I just want to confirm uh, our next meeting is two weeks later, but with a different time slot, right? Right. We're, 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 off, off, right? we're, off, okay. we're alternating time slots to spread the inconvenience around. We'll see how the, let's, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how well this works and how many people keep up with it. But yet, <laughs> yes, it is two weeks and it is it is it is it is a different time slot. Okay, so it's a uh, the, the swap is twelve hours difference, right? If I remember correctly. You do remember correctly. Okay, thanks. Thank you for confirming that.